you have your Bible, look at uh, Mark chapter 4 with me. And we'll look at the parable of the sower. Uh, and this parable uh, of the sower, of the seeds, is in all three Gospels, uh, the synoptic Gospels, uh, Matthew, Luke, and John. And, uh, and so we want, we want to look at uh, how Mark... Uh, cites this, this teaching for us. We see a little more in Matthew that Jesus is in a boat and he's about to teach um, the disciples about what it means to follow him. The emphasis is on the kingdom of God. And we'll discuss what that means, uh, being in the kingdom of God. Uh, but he starts out with the parable. And so let's, let's look at this and I'll explain the, the parable in a minute. But starting... Uh, in chapter 4 of, uh, of Mark, if you have your Bible, uh, you can read along with me. It's the parable of the sower. Again, he began to teach beside the sea. And a very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the, the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teachings, he said to them, listen, that's the key word, listen. A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil. And immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil, and when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no, no, no grain. And other seeds fell into the good soil and produced grain growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold, sixtyfold, and a hundredfold. And he said... He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when, he had, and when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given this, the secret of the kingdom of God. But for the outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see but not perceive. And may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word, and those are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word and it proves unfruitful. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. Now, the word parable means to come alongside. Uh, it is a metaphor comparing a spiritual truth with a physical reality. The people of Jesus today, they understood what it meant to sow seed. And so he uses that, the, the physical, to explain a spiritual truth. So every parable has two levels of understanding, a physical and a spiritual side or dimension uh, to it. And so he says in verse 3, listen. Listen. If you have ears to hear, listen. Let them hear. It's like a 92-year-old man went to the doctor for a physical. 
And so a couple weeks later, the doctor saw him out on the street and uh, was very pleased with what he saw. And so on the man's next visit, on his 93rd birthday, the doctor said, I see you're doing very well. He said, yeah, doc, I'm doing just what you said. He said, well, what did I say? You said, well, you said, get a hot mom and be cheerful. The doctor said, I didn't say that. You didn't listen. I said, I didn't say that. I said, you have a heart murmur, be careful. <laughs> you know, like when Lee and I were on vacation, uh, we were in a store getting some groceries, and uh, she was behind me, and I didn't hear. I don't hear things very well behind me now. And uh, finally, I said, are we going this way? And she yelled at me. She said, yes. I can say that she's not here. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I said, well, you don't have to yell at me. She said, us four times, I said, Lindsay, we're going this way. I went listening very well. And so Jesus is saying, listen. This is very important that you understand what is going on. So by examining the three aspects of the parable, the sower, one sees Jesus illustrating how the word of God produces a kingdom of God breakthrough into a person's life. So let's look at the sower. So we'll break it down in three sides. The sower, uh, the seed, uh, and then finally uh, we, we see the sower and the seed. And finally we see uh, uh, the soils that we want to look at. And so this, this is what he talks about when he talks about the sower. The one who preaches and teaches or witnesses with the word of God, you are sowing the seed of God. You're sowing that seed and into a person's life. And so what you're really sowing is the kingdom of God into that person's life. Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, in Matthew, he says, the kingdom of heaven. So if you read in Matthew, he's speaking to Jews in, in, the, in, in uh, Matthew. And so he uses the kingdom of heaven because that's what they can identify with. In Mark and Luke, they use the kingdom of God. They're synonymous, so don't get confused when you read in Matthew and then you read in Mark and Luke, kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven. It's the same kingdom that Jesus is talking about. He also says, seek first the kingdom of God seek, and his righteousness, and all these things shall be gathered unto you. And so it's, it's seeking, it's repent. And it's seeking the kingdom of God. Now, that when he was teaching these things about the sower and teaching these, these he, he was way above what the scribes and Pharisees were teaching. If you read in, in, in Mark 1, 22, 27, 28, and 45, and, and 2, 12, and 13, you will see that, hey, the people were amazed, amazed at what Jesus was teaching. They have never heard things of this. As I said in our Bible study uh, on Wednesday, I said, Jesus was a rebel. Lord didn't like that, but that's okay, Lord. <laughs> but, but, but he was a rebel, and he was teaching, he was saying, the way you do religion, Pharisees and scribes, will not get you into the kingdom of God, you see. Because it's not your rules, it's not your rituals, it is a relationship with me that will get you into the kingdom of God. I don't care how much you worship, all the finer, you know, I sort of enjoyed the, the fellowship hall. It was, it was pretty cool, you know, because we didn't have any of the fineries that we have. We didn't have any stained glass windows or crosses or anything, uh, you know, to make it a more ritual experience. We had the word of God only. And so I, I like what we have. But that's not, what the, that's not what worship is. Worship is worshiping the one and only Jesus Christ, who is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And so this is what we see. And so the kingdom of God uh, breaks into the world, even as seeds, which is sown on the ground, breaks through the soil. And so this is what he wants to show for us in this, in, in this teaching. And then the kingdom of God defined is God's kingdom as the visible demonstration of the comprehensive rule of God over every area of life. Now let me read that again. The visible demonstration 
of the comprehensive rule of God over every area of life. So he is king. He has authority over your life. Now, how do you come into the kingdom of God? What did he tell Nicodemus? So Nicodemus, if you want to see the, the kingdom of God, you have to be what? Born again. So you have to have, you, you have to repent. You have to be born again so that you can come into the kingdom of God. A kingdom of God heart is a humble heart, says Mark 10, 15. The kingdom of God is, is what, what is preached and it tells that there's a new life in the kingdom of God. Luke 8, 1 tells us. Great riches can hinder you from entering the kingdom of God, so says Luke 18. The character of the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, Romans 14, 17 tells us. There is power by being in the kingdom of God, 1 Corinthians 4, 20 tells us. And then we, we see in Hebrews that it reflects the sovereignty of God. It also it operates from His glory. And then finally, we see in Matthew 6, 10, it, is, it operates for His will. For your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so it's all about the kingdom of God. You see, the church is to make the, the invisible kingdom visible. That's what Chuck Colson said in some of his writings. He said, well, our responsibility as individuals and as the church is to make the invisible kingdom visible. And so how do we do that? How do we make it visible in your life? And so hopefully as we unfold uh, the sermon, we can see how we can do that. So now let's look at the seed. The seed is the word of God. Now, if you go to North Carolina, on the coast of North Carolina, there are 12 lighthouses on the coast. Now, Cape Hatteras is the tallest of the lighthouses uh, on the coast. It is 200 feet high, and it has 268 steps, which Lee and I have walked uh, before. It's the 23rd tallest in the world. Now, there's a, a plaque outside the uh, lighthouse that, was, that, that a federal officer wrote in 1861, it said of Cape Hatteras Lighthouse, it sends forth light, its cheering ray to the storm-beaten mariner. It sends forth its cheering ray to the storm-beaten mariner. The Word of God is a lamp unto our feet, says Psalm 119, 105. Your Word is a lamp to my feet, and a light to my path. You so in our in our stormy lives, in our stormy lives, what do we see? We see there's light in the Word of God. It's going to give us direction of how to navigate through the stormy life that we might have. And so this is what we see uh, through it. Now, if you read First uh, Peter uh, chapter one, starting with verse twenty-two, listen to what Peter says. Having purified your hearts by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of the Lord. And so we see in Peter that the word of God is living and it's abiding and it's light for us. If you're ever confused of how to navigate a situation, you go to the Word of God and you'll find an answer. That's where you'll find your answer. It's not going to be through a psychologist, sociologist, philanthropist, philanthropist you know, or an economist. It's going to be through the Word of God that you find an answer of how to handle, how to navigate your life. William Paley in 1700s wrote a book uh, that was required reading for all college students at one time, and it was his natural theology. And it taught that there was an intelligent designer that it wasn't like what Darwin said, uh, that evolution was what caused it, but Paley said, no, it was an intelligent designer. Now, Lee and I, you know, we spent, uh, you know, three days at the Creation Museum and one day at the Ark last week, and the whole purpose of the Creation Museum is to debunk 
the theory of evolution. That the world is not millions of years old, but only thousands of years old. In fact, I'm going to do a, a sermon series starting in January on the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Because as you'll see in a minute, uh, from something else that happened in our history of, as Baptists, that they... Um, that the liberal theologian said that the first 11 chapters of Genesis is myth. It's not historical. So Darwin, he read this work of Pele's, and he says, pretty good. But Darwin, in 1859 or 58, he wrote his, his book on evolution, and um, that has become the standard for uh, students in our educational system today. But Baptists, they reacted to that. In 1925, we had we the Baptist Faith and Message, 19, uh, 1925, Baptist Faith and Message. And as you know, in 20, 1925, there was a Scopes trial called the Monkey Trial in, in Tennessee, where the a ACLU, they uh, pushed through teaching evolution in the public school system. Prior to that, it was creationism. But in 1925, it changed, and it's the way it is today, that they teach um, uh, evolution in the school system. So E.Y. Mullins, who was the coordinator of the document, the 1925 Baptist Faith and Message, he says, we believe that the Holy Bible was written by men divinely inspired and is a perfect treasure of heavenly instruction. It has God for its author, salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error. For its matter, it reveals the principles by which God will judge us and therefore is and will remain to the end of the world the true center of Christian union and the, and the supreme standard by which all human conduct, creeds, and religious opinions should be tried. So th what they were saying is creationism, not evolution, is the way God created, brought everything into being. Some, pe some people will say, well, how about being a theistic evolution, God, or theistic evolutions, that God used evolution uh, to bring the world into being. That can't be. And I'll explain that reason in January. Well, let's jump ahead about four decades in 1963, and Southern Baptists again uh, re rewrote their Baptist faith and message in 1963. The reason well, it was over the Elliot, the Elliot controversy. And Eliot uh, was a theologian and a teacher in our seminaries, and he wrote a commentary on Genesis. And he's the one that said that, that Genesis, the first 11 chapters, is myth, not historic. And so again, the Southern Baptists wrote uh, in their uh, document that, uh, that Genesis was indeed historical. See, Eliot tried to torpedo uh, Noah's Ark and uh, saying that's not, that really didn't happen. It wasn't true. But as you know, Jesus mentioned Noah through the, his teachings as recorded in Matthew and Luke. And so again, the whole issue of family came up in 2000. And so again, the Baptist faith and message said two things. One, family uh, is a husband and wife. And second, that only men could be pastors. And so that's in our document in, in, in the 2000 Baptist Faith and Message. So it, it's the Word of God, it is the Word of God that is sown, that we speak, and the Word of God always will come up against world views. We're in a cosmic battle. The Christian worldview and the world view. Which view are you going to hold to? Which view are you going to teach in your home? See, there's two different, and this is, this is what Jesus is saying. The kingdom of God is about a Christian worldview. It's, it's about that the Bible is indeed inerrant. The Bible is reliable because, listen, if you believe that the first 11 chapters of Genesis is not historical, why would you want to believe that Jesus rose from the dead why would you want to believe that? If you take one part out and say it's not true, then why not go ahead and say the resurrection is not true either? You see. 
And so that's, that's what we have. And so now we come to the, the four soils that we see in our text today. So look at verse 15 uh, of our text, and we see uh, what Jesus is saying. And there are the ones that the seed along the, came along the path where the word is sown, and when they have heard, Satan immediately comes and takes it away. And so the sower is sowing the seed, and a lot of the seed, let's say, let's say you two, both sides of the garden over here, and this is the path that he's sowing. The path is worn and it's hard surface, and so the seed cannot penetrate the path that the sower is sowing from. And so the seed is sown, but Satan comes right along and takes it right away. See, I've seen this so many times. People say, you know, Pastor, great sermon, you know. Uh, I really moved today. But you never see him again. They're not in church anywhere. There's something happened, but the word never took root in their lives. So that's, that's the first illustration that we see. The next, in verses 16 through 17, is the casual heart or the shallow hearted. Let's look at verses 16. Excuse me. 16 and 17. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground, uh, the ones who were who heard, they heard the word, immediately received it with joy, and they have no root in themselves, but endured for a while. And when tribulation and persecution uh, arises on account of the word, immediately they fell away. So again, the rocky soil, um, as you see here, uh, illustrated for the children, the rocky soil has a, in Palestine is a thin layer of soil over the rocky soil. And it can't bear root. And again, it is taken away. I think I read to you the worldly heart on that one. And the, okay, here's, here's the next one. And the others are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word, but the, the cares of the world and the deceitful, deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. In my second church in Shelby, North Carolina, uh, a neighbor plowed a field right next to, my, to our house. And I planted that thing. I mean, I had all kinds of stuff growing in that garden. And so before we went on our two-week vacation, I got all the weeds out. I mean, it was pristine. Came back two weeks later, filled with wire grass. You know what I told the, my neighbor? Plow it under. <laughs> I wasn't going to pick that. I wasn't going to weed that thing again. I said, just plow it under. And, this, and that, that's what happens. We hear the word of God, especially in our culture, because we have such a materialistic culture. You, you know, we hear the word of God, but you know, I love the things of this world more than I love God. Isn't that true? And so it chokes off what the Word of God is saying. You see, l listen. Christianity is not easy. It is not easy because you have so many temptations all around you. So many temptations. And so we always have to go back, refer to the Word of God, showing you how to live your life, showing how to live my life for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then the final one is verse 20. But those seeds that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word, accept it, bear fruit 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. Now, here's the question. How can I have a broken heart to receive the Word of God? If you look at the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Now, poor in spirit means spiritually bankrupt. 
I see myself as spiritually bankrupt in need of God. And then the next one, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And so you, you see your sin and you mourn your sin. And then he says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And so the meek is the person who's not trampled over, but has power under control, and he is the one or she is the one whose heart is broken and can receive the word of God. What stands in the way is our pride. We allow our pride to stand in the way of what God wants to do in and through our lives. And so we, we want to say, God, I can do it better than you. I know better than you how to navigate my life. That's not what God says in His Word. He said, if you want to know the kingdom of God and be in the kingdom of God, you must repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. You must come to know Jesus Christ. And so as you read the Word, the Word will begin to take root in your life and your life begins to transform. You look back on your life, and I say, Lindsay, why in the world did I do the things that I did? Why? Because I had a hard heart, you see. And so for, to be fruitful, to multiply, then the soil has to be pliable. It has to be broken so that you can receive the Word of God and that you can flourish and you can grow. You see the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5.20? That begins to be manifested in your life. Love and joy and peace, kindness, long-suffering, that's patience. All these things, these nine fruit, begin to be manifested in your life. Then we can live, as we conclude, we can live like God is alive. That's what Martin Luther did. You know, Martin Luther, he posted in 1517 the 95 Thesis uh, against the, in the door, on the door of Wittenberg Church. And he was coming against the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church didn't like it. And so they were going to persecute him. So five years later, in 1522, he, he addressed the Diet of Worms. That is a bunch of Catholics on this, on this forum, and this is what he said. Since your majesty and lordships desire a simple reply, I will answer without distract distinctions. Unless I'm convinced by the testimony of sacred scripture or by the evident reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive by the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything. For to go against my conscience is neither right nor safe. God help me. Here I stand. I can do no other. And that's our, that's our, that's our call. If you want to live and have life, then you've got to stand on the word of God. You've got to let that word sink in and grow in your life. And that is how you live. That is how, you, in, in all, this con all these controversies that we have in our culture, you can have the peace that passes all understanding because you have Jesus Christ and because you have his word. I don't care what happens in your life, you can have that peace. You can live for God because you live for the word of God and for what he's taught us in the word of God as well. And so the, the parable of the sowers is wonderful. And these next 11 parables that we'll look at are all challenging. Because it puts the focus on Jesus and not on us. It's all on him and what he can do and will do uh, as we gravitate to him and love him. I believe this. Your relationship with God, you're as close to God as you are as close to His Word. Let me say that again. You're as close to God 
as you are to his word. Because when the word speaks, God speaks. Because it's the living word. These are words from God. And he's the one who died for you, who loves you, and cares for you, and who's your shepherd, and you want to hear from him. So every day, you need to be in the word. To some extent. Because that's where you get life. That's where you get your energy, if you will, to follow and to pursue uh, the Lord Jesus Christ.